Um, today's event, Money Management with Rachel Richards, is a unique experience we are so proud to share with our current undergraduate students. Rachel is the best-selling author of Money Honey and Passive Income Aggressive Retirement. Our 1856 Society members who have tuned in tonight will be receiving a copy of her book, Money Honey. And the 1856 Society recognizes students who have given back to the university by donating $18.56 or more to an area on campus they're passionate about, like the Student Emergency Fund, your school or college, or anywhere else that you're interested in supporting. We will add the link to learn more and join in the chat box if you're interested in becoming a member this evening. We are looking forward to an engaging discussion today about money management. If you have any questions at all for Rachel, feel free to include them in the chat as you think of them. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Rachel. Rachel, feel free to take it away. Thank you so much, Leanne. It is a pleasure to be hosting today's webinar. Thank you guys for showing up. This is going to be a lot of fun. I know there's a lot of interest around passive income and early retirement and how I did what I did. So. I'm going to do my best to share all of my knowledge with you and answer all of your questions as well. So I'm going to start off by just um, telling you a little bit more about who I am. I am a lot of things. I'm a former financial advisor. I'm a best-selling author of two books. I'm a real estate investor. My husband and I own almost 40 rental units. And what people find most intriguing about me is that last year at the age of 27, I quit my job and retired. And I'm now living off over $15,000 per month in a passive income. My husband and I just moved out to Colorado earlier this year because we felt like it. It's a lot of fun. And now I get to work when, where, and if I want. And what people ask me a lot, and let's go ahead and get this out of the way, because a lot of people will ask, oh, you must be a trust fund baby. You know, are you a trust fund baby? Where'd your money come from? And no, I am not a trust fund baby. In fact, I never even made six figures in a job or a career. In my first job af after college, I was only making $36,000. So my journey is really about living frugally, learning about money management, and making a lot of progress without having like financial help from the very beginning. So what I want to talk about today, and I'll try to talk fast so that I can leave time at the end for Q&A, but I'm going to define first what passive income is. I'll talk about some of the types of passive income. I'm going to talk a lot about real estate investing specifically because I did see a lot of the questions that you guys submitted beforehand, and I can tell there's a lot of interest on that. So I will talk about, I'll give specific information on how I pick my investments, then I will talk about one of my other big passive income streams, which is book royalties. Um, next, I'm going to explain the concept of income diversification and why this is so important. Finally, I will show you how to get started, even if you're a college student without a lot of money. And then again, if we have time, I'll open it up for Q&A. So let's get started. I'm going to start with defining passive income. To me, passive income is money that is earned with little to no ongoing effort. I know it sounds too good to be true, but it's not. And it's definitely not a get rich quick scheme either. It does take time or money to create passive income. But once you have a passive income stream created and you have it going, then it becomes a lot more hands off and that's when it becomes passive. Now, is anything really passive, like 100% passive? Maybe portfolio income where you're putting a bunch of money in the stock market and earning dividends. Maybe that's 100% passive. But the problem with that is that you normally have to have a ton of capital to generate any kind of meaningful return. So it's not quite as attainable as other types of passive income. Most passive income streams will require a few hours a month or a couple hours a week of work to maintain. But in my opinion, that is way more passive than working a nine to five job or working 40 hours a week. So that's what passive income is all about. Now, a lot of people will say, well, Rachel, you're clearly still working, right? So you're not really retired. And that is correct. So I use the terms retirement and financially independent interchangeably. It's really more about now I work when, where, and if I want. So I don't have to work anymore. And certainly I could do the beach thing and really not do anything. And a lot of people do that and and when they retire. And I think that's great. The problem with me is that I get bored really easily. So I would not be able to do that for very long. I always want to be creating and building the next thing, which is why I have my books and my courses and 
my mastermind, and I'm just kind of always having projects to work on. So that's my definition of retirement. Now, here's why I think passive income is so crucial for younger generations. I talk a lot about the nest egg theory, the nest egg theory. Basically, the way we've traditionally saved for retirement is we have worked all of our lives, nine to five job, 40 hour week, work all the way until we're 65, accumulate a bunch of money, and then we retire and we live off of that nest egg for the rest of our lives. Okay, so that used to work really well. It did. There didn't used to be a problem with that, but times have changed and the way we're approaching retirement hasn't changed with it. So now it's becoming a lot more difficult. For example, we now have a longer life expectancy. So that's more years of retirement we have to fund. Also, as you guys know, the cost of college has really increased and that's placed a, a burden on our generation that previous generations didn't necessarily have to deal with. And the most alarming thing is that the Social Security Trust Fund is projected to be fully depleted by the year 2035. Okay, that is 15 years from now. I mean, that's scary to think about. So our generation can't even rely on Social Security income to supplement our retirement. So in my opinion, the nest egg theory just isn't what it used to be. When I think about passive income though, I had an epiphany several years ago that once your passive income exceeds your living expenses, you're retired, you're financially independent. And the way I looked at it is, it sounds kind of difficult to save one or $2 million by age 65, not to mention the fact that I wanna enjoy my life now, not in 40 years. So passive income to me is a lot more attainable. I think it's way easier for someone to generate five or six or $8,000 a month in passive income. And it doesn't matter your income or your age, anyone can start building passive income and retire early. So that's a little bit about what passive income is. Next, I'm gonna talk about some of the types of passive income. Um, in my book, Passive Income Aggressive Retirement, I outlined 28 different models. So trust me when I say there is something out there for everyone. Now, the big one that I already kind of mentioned is portfolio income. We've kind of all already heard of this when um, normally people that are older or that have a lot of wealth accumulated already, they can invest that money in the stock market and earn dividends. And so they can earn like monthly or quarterly income to sustain them. So that's one type of passive income. Again, it's unrealistic because you have to have so much capital for it to work that you can't start doing that right away necessarily. Another big one is rental income. And I'm gonna talk about this a lot more in just a few minutes. So rental income is where you can invest in real estate, you can buy a rental property, your tenants pay for the mortgage and then some. So then you're earning a profit each month. And that can be very passive, especially when you hire a property manager. That's the one thing is if you want rental income to be passive, you have to have a property management company in place because chances are none of us want to quit our full-time jobs to become full-time landlords. So property manager is key. And then another big one that I think is really fun and unique is coin operated machines. So think of something like a vending machine or an ATM or a coin operated washi washer and drying machine that you could put in a multifamily building. Basically, if you can find the location, and that's the hardest part is finding the location, but if you can find a location and put laundry in an apartment building or put a vending machine in the lobby of an office building, that's the hardest part. And then you basically would go around once a week to restock and collect any money. And even that part can be outsourced. It's a little bit more attainable because with a rental income, sometimes if you're going the traditional route, you will need to come up with a 20 to 25% down payment. Um, and with portfolio income, you need a lot of money. But with coin-operated machines, normally these machines can cost $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, and that's it. So it's a little bit more affordable. Okay, so those are some of the big types. I want to narrow in on real estate investing specifically and rental properties specifically. So I'm going to talk a lot about that for the next few minutes. So my journey began in 2017. Okay, before that, I didn't have any passive income. I was working full time. I still even worked full time in 2018 and 2019 until I quit my job. But in 2017, my husband and I purchased our first rental property. We purchased a duplex in Louisville, Kentucky. 
That's where all of our properties are located, Louisville, Kentucky, because that's where we were living at the time. I had actually lived there for 20 years. Now, a lot of people will ask me, okay, where did you come up with the money for your down payment? So we had three things going for us that allowed us to purchase properties and scale our, our real estate quickly. First of all, I graduated college without debt. So I don't know if any of you have heard of Cutco Cutlery. Has anyone heard of Cutco knives made in America, high quality knives? If you've heard of it, you probably know that it's sold. College students typically sell them through appointments. Um, so that's what I did. I sold Cutco, I paid my way through school and I graduated debt free. My husband is a veteran. Um, we didn't know each other at the time, but he used his military benefits to pay for his college. So when we both graduated, we didn't have any student debt and we didn't have any other debt either. So that's a huge thing that we had going for us, which meant that even on a $36,000 income, I was finding ways to save half of my income. I was living very frugally off like $1,500 a month. Um, and I, like I said, I never made six figures from a job or a career. I just was good at saving. And then the other thing we had going for us is that we invested in Louisville, Kentucky. I think anywhere in the Midwest is a great place to invest because housing prices are low, cost of living is reasonable, and your money can go a lot further in the Midwest than it can in like New York or Chicago or California. So it's, it's more attainable to invest in the Midwest. So that's how we came up with the money for the down payment is just that we were both saving for years, didn't have debt. So we were saving for years pretty aggressively. Our first duplex in 2017 cost $100,000. So we needed to come up with a 20% down payment. By then my husband and I each had 10 grand that we were able to put in to buy that first duplex. And I was 24 years old at the time. That's when I started. Okay, now in terms of how I scaled, there's one thing that I did that made a really big difference for us. And at that point, I had my real estate license. So I will take you back a couple years in the story. Right after I graduated, I became a financial advisor. I have a financial economics degree. So my whole background and all my experience has always been in finance. I was a, an advisor for about a year and then I decided that I didn't wanna do a sales job because that's really what it is when you're starting out. So I didn't know what to do next. So I, I took a couple stints in the real estate industry. And I remember feeling like I, I feel overqualified for this. That's, that's what I thought at the time. But a lot of good things came out of those jobs. I got my real estate license for free because the company paid for it. And I learned a lot about closing transactions and how to use the multiple listing service and all those things. So even though I felt like it was a waste of time at the time. Sometimes it's interesting how in hindsight you can connect the dots and see, oh, I was meant to do that. And that's that's what taught me this. And that's what got me to where I am now. So I had my real estate license. It was never for the purpose of having clients or helping people buy and sell their houses. It was only for my own purposes as an investor. Meaning I would represent myself as the buyer's agent on every single building or property that we bought. So with every purchase, we would completely deplete our savings. We would wipe out our savings. But then I would immediately get a commission check back for thousands of dollars because I was the real estate agent on the deal. And we would put that towards the down payment of the next property. And I really think that's one of the reasons we were able to scale so quickly. Because by then, we were still saving at a high rate. Then we were making cash flow from the property, which we were saving all of that to reinvest. And I got that commission check. So that's how we were able to scale quickly and go from um, zero units at the, begin of 20, at the beginning of 2017 to almost 40 units by 2019. And when I say units, guys, I mean doors. I don't mean 40 buildings. We have six buildings total. A lot of them are multifamily, though, so we have almost 40 units within those six buildings. Um, okay, one of the questions that I got beforehand was how I chose properties to invest in. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about my real estate portfolio and my future plans, and then I'll switch to book royalties. So how I decide which properties to invest in, the first thing for me and for every other investor I know is to decide on location. So deciding which state, which city, and even which zip codes in that city you want to invest in. For example, in Louisville, Kentucky, I wanted to feel safe as a young woman, woman to go collect rent on my own if I needed to. 
So there were certain areas that I eliminated because of the crime rate and I didn't feel safe. So that's what I mean by narrowing down your location and really figuring out which zip codes specifically you're open to investing in. That's the first thing. <clears throat> the second thing is that I had two key metrics that I went by for all of my purchases. So when I was doing analysis or considering a property, the property needed to meet these two key metrics. Number one is the cash flow. And I mean net cash flow. I mean the profit that you're taking home each month. I wanted to make at least two to $300 per unit. That was my goal. The second one was cash on cash ROI, cash on cash return on investment. And for those of you taking notes, I'll give you the calculation. You basically divide the annual profit, the annual net cash flow, divided by the initial investment. That's how you calculate cash on cash ROI. So it makes the investment easy to analyze because then you can compare that to other rates of return you would get on other investments. For example, I knew that if I invested in the stock market, I could probably earn 8 to 10% over the long term. That's a standard long-term return on the stock market. So the way I saw it is if rental income was going to be more work, I wanted to be making more money from it. So I aimed for a cash on cash ROI of 12%. If I couldn't get that, it wasn't worth it to me. And this will be different for everybody. Those are just the requirements that I had. So location, cash flow of two to $300 and cash on cash ROI of 12%. Those were my metrics. That's how I found the properties that I knew I wanted to make an offer on. Okay, so my current holdings, um, because 2017 is when we started, we bought that first duplex. By then, we actually also had a primary residence because it was my husband's previous home and we kept it and rented that out as a rental. So we have two single family homes because of that same thing. It was just our previous houses that we kept and rented out. So two single family homes, one duplex, which is two units, and then we have three big buildings that are more of like apartment style buildings that have, um, I won't remember the exact numbers, but I think 12 units, 11 units, and 11 units, something like that. So that is our portfolio of real estate currently. Um, now I did get a question, what's my future plan? Will I keep them? Will I transition out? Am I gonna keep acquiring properties? Um, so I'm glad somebody asked this because sometimes I get, a, like surprise or shock because I'm not I'm not looking to expand my real estate portfolio. I'm not looking to build an empire. And a lot of real estate investors do that. And I think that's great. For me, real estate investing is not something I've ever been so passionate about that that's what I wanted to do my whole life. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm passionate about it because of what it does for us. I do think it's one of the best tools for building long-term wealth. And there's so many benefits to investing in real estate. There's the cash flow, there's the tax benefits, there's the equity buildup, potential appreciation. So it's like there's four benefits that I just listed. I mean, it's it's really a great thing for young people to get into. But for me, all that being true, real estate investing was only ever a means to an end, meaning that once we got a certain level of income from our real estate investing, we were not interested in continue, continuing to acquire and grow it beyond that. Our initial thought was, let's get to $10,000 a month in passive income. And once we got to that, we stopped acquiring. I think we actually purchased our last one in 2018. So um, I don't plan on growing my empire anymore. If anything, we are thinking about selling some of the properties in Louisville, Kentucky, and transitioning those investments into something even more passive. So we're considering that now, but, but for now, we're just going to keep going as, as is. Okay, so that's a little bit about real estate investing. Um, if you have questions, keep them in mind or go ahead and write them down so we can come back to that later. But next, I want to talk about my other big passive income stream, which is my book royalties. And to this day, we have, I think, five or six passive income streams, but there are two of them that are really, really big. Okay, and I'm very transparent about my income, so you can ask me anything about that. Um, in, a, in a normal month from our rental properties, we're making anywhere from eight to 10 grand a month in profit. From book royalties from my business, 
I'm making an average of about $5,000 per month in profit just from selling books. So that's our other really big income stream. And I want to talk a little bit about how I was able to do that. And if you're interested in writing a book, I'll give you some pointers. So my first book is Money Honey, which you can see behind me, but this is it. And I wrote this in 2017. So 2017 was a big year for us because we created multiple passive income streams that year. But the reason I wrote it is because by then I had already been a financial advisor and all of my family and friends came to me for financial advice, which I loved. That's, that's what I love to do. I began to wonder though, well, why aren't they reading books or learning about money online? And then the thought occurred to me of, oh yeah, that's because personal finance is boring, right? It's overwhelming, it's intimidating, it's complex. No wonder people don't like to learn about it. So I thought to myself, well, how can I make this topic sassy and fun and simple? And that's where the idea for Money Honey came from. It was scary writing it. I mean, at first it was fun. The words poured out of me, but it was scary writing it. It was a scary process because anytime you, you're putting your work out there for somebody else to judge, that's a very vulnerable thing. So I definitely had some difficulties in like going through with it and actually doing it. But at the end of the day, I told myself, if I can just help one person, that's all I want to do. And I think if I had been out to make some quick money grab or a ton of money from this book, people would have seen right through that and it wouldn't have done as well. So I had the right intentions of truly coming from a place of just wanting to help people and add value to their lives. And I think that's part of why it took off. It, I mean, it became more successful than I ever would have imagined. I've sold 20,000 copies by now. I have over 700 Amazon reviews on Money Honey. So it's really resonated, especially with female millennials. I think the other thing about writing a book and writing a successful one is that there are thousands of other books out there, right? There's thousands of other products. Personal finance is a very saturated topic on Amazon. So you have to be able to articulate why would someone want to buy your book or your product over the thousands that are already out there. And if you can't articulate that well, you won't see success. You just won't have success with it because the reader wants to know what's in it for me. Why should I care? Why should I buy your book? So that's kind of the first step in thinking about creating a, an ebook or an audiobook or creating an online course or any, any type of content where you're teaching people is why should they care and what makes yours different. With Money Honey, mine was all about taking this topic of finance, which is traditionally boring, and making it fun and easy to understand. So that's what set it apart. So that's just what I wanted to say about book royalty income. Um, I published my second book in 2019. I'm happy to go, to go into more detail about that passive income stream and other strategies that I use. So if you have any questions, um, be writing them down and I can try to address those near the end. So I'm gonna talk about my where I am income wise right now. I'm gonna talk about income diversification and then how to get started and then we'll do Q&A. Okay, so income wise, we are now making over $15,000 per month in passive income. And I'll, I'll just outline a few of our income streams because like I said, we have five or six now. Our rental income brings in eight to, eight to a month in profit. Book royalties is another five grand in profit. My online courses that I have now bring in probably $2,000 a month. Um, we just invested in real estate syndications. I can go into that in more detail as well. And we haven't received our first um, distributions yet, but I'm expecting about $600 a month from that. And then we are also invested in Fundrise, which is a real estate crowdsourcing platform. Called, it's called Fundrise, all one word. And I make like $100 from that in profit. So those are basically our five or six passive income streams. Totals up to 15 grand a month or more than that in some months. Okay, income diversification. So I wanna to touch on this because I've been talking about this a lot um, in podcast interviews recently because there's this misconception out there that having a full-time job or being a salaried employee equates to job security and income security. But that is not true. If you are 100% dependent on a single source of income, there's nothing secure about that. 
Because what happens if you lose your job or your hours get cut or you get laid off? And we've seen that, unfortunately, this year with coronavirus more than ever. So this is reality. If you really want to safeguard your finances and protect your income, you need to consider doing something called income diversification. This simply means having multiple sources of income. That way, when one income stream is impacted or lost, you have other income streams to keep you afloat. So I'm going to share a personal example because our income was definitely impacted by COVID this year, and not a lot of people realize that at all. So you already know how much I was making in rental income profit in a normal month, up to 10 grand. In April, though, we only made $1,000 in profit from our rentals. Okay, that is like a 90% loss of, income, of profit. So that was a huge blow. The way I saw it is, okay, there's probably a lot of other landlords that are worse off than me. There's probably landlords that are doing better than I am. But if I can just break even for a few months, I will be happy with that. And the only reason I wasn't in a total panic during that time is because we have other income streams to keep us afloat. So that's what I really would want you guys to take away from this webinar is income diversification. You know, there's, there's two ways to safeguard your finances. One is to build an emergency savings fund and stock up a bunch of money, but that's only going to last so long. The true way to me is to have multiple sources of income. That's really what's going to protect you. Okay, last thing I want to talk about before we open it up to Q&A is how to get started. What things can you do, whether you're a college student, whether you have money or not, that you can get started on today? So number one is um, learning, learning everything that you can. I've always been an avid reader. So as you can see, there's a huge bookshelf behind me. There's a lot of books about real estate investing. Obviously, I'd love for you to read mine, Passive Income, Aggressive Retirement. And if you're looking for more rental property investing like information specifically, there's a book called Hold by Steve Chater. Hold by Steve Chater. It's one of my favorite books and I recommend it to all real estate investors. So that's what I would recommend. You can also listen to podcasts. Two of my favorites are Afford Anything. Um, Paula Pant of Afford Anything. She talks a lot about real estate investing and money management, so it's a good mix. And then Bigger Pockets is the platform that's just known for real estate investing. So they have a great podcast as well. So that's the first thing is to learn. But I want to caution you because if you spend years and years consuming information and learning, at some point you have to transition and take action, right? Because knowledge is nothing without execution. So you have to recognize that at one point, you're going to have done everything you can, and you just have to get started. I know it's a scary thing. My first investment property purchase was scary too. I felt somewhat confident with the knowledge that I had, but it's still a scary thing. The way I looked at it, though, is I just accepted the fact that I was going to make mistakes. I, I, you're going to make mistakes on your first, second, third, all every single property you buy. and I that's a complete fact because that's happened with every single one of mine. So once you accept that, that can help you kind of move past that hesitation. Um, you're just going to learn the, the more you do, the more that you will learn. You'll learn as you go. Okay. Second thing you can do, put your team together. If you're specifically interested in real estate investing, you need to have a team in place. Uh, what I mean by that is having a realtor that is knowledgeable with investment property specifically. You want a realtor that works with investors on a regular basis. You can ask around for recommendations. Um, normally, there is a local real estate investors association in your city, so you can look up to see if your city has one. And if not, you can go on Meetup and find all these different real estate investing clubs. But the best way to find some of these good contacts is through networking and asking around. So you want a good realtor, you want a good lender, and you want a good lender before you start looking because you want to understand how much you're going to be approved for. You're going to want to understand what the closing costs are going to be so that you can analyze some of the properties you're looking at. So you definitely need a lender. Um, stay away from the big national banks. That is my <laughs> biggest advice. And I saw this working for a realtor for a year. I know this as just being my own investor. Stay away from the big banks like Chase and Republic and Wells Fargo. They're slow. 
and they just don't have as much flexibility as a small local lender. So again, ask for recommendations to find a small local lender or a credit union because normally they provide better service and they can work with you and be more flexible. And then you also need to have a good insurance agent. Um, they, these are easier to find. There's a lot of insurance agents out there. You can get recommended to them, but definitely get multiple quotes. That's the thing. Get multiple quotes from multiple people. Make sure you're getting the best rate possible. So that would be your team that you would want to put together. Um, and then in terms of passive income as a broad category, because not everyone out there wants to invest in real estate and that's fine. I would say though, if you're looking to create passive income and you don't know where to start, what you wanna ask yourself first is, do you have more time or more money to invest? Because you have to have one or the other or both to invest in order to create the passive income stream. Now, if you're anything like I was a few years ago, I would have said, I have neither. I don't have time and I don't have money. So the next question to ask yourself is, okay, which one's going to be easier for you to free up more of? Will it be easier for you to free up time, even 20 minutes a day? Or will it be easier for you to come up with some extra money that you can invest? That's where I would start and I would narrow it down from there. So something like portfolio income requires a lot of money and not a lot of time. Something like a royalty income stream, like a book or an online course, requires a lot of time and not a lot of money. I launched Money Honey for less than $600. So royalties are a good one to focus on if you have more time than money. With real estate investing, a lot of people think that you have to have a lot of money to get started. But if I knew then what I know now, I would have been able to start investing in real estate a lot earlier. And don't get me wrong, 24 is not bad, but I could have started even earlier. So for those interested in real estate investing, but you feel like you don't have enough money to get started, I'm going to walk you through two quick strategies. Number one is house hacking. House hacking is where you purchase a property as your primary residence, and then you live in it, and you can either fix it up and flip it and sell it later for a profit, or maybe you're living in a duplex or a triplex you know, that has two or three units. You're living in one of the units and renting out the others. That's the two ways that you house hack. Now, here's why this is so cool, because when you buy an investment property, you have to put 20 to 25% down. There is no way around that. And there's no lender that I've ever heard of that would accept less than that. But when you're buying a property as your primary residence and you're going to live there, that's how you get around the down payment requirement. So a lot of people, if you're a first time home buyer, you can get an FHA loan with three and a half percent down. If you're a veteran, you can get a VA loan with zero percent down. Or even if you just want to qualify for a conventional mortgage, you can often pay 5 to 10% down. So that'll save you a lot of money on buying your first investment property, and then you'll scale up from there. Okay, so that's house hacking. Um, there's a book that I know of, and I can't remember the name, but I think it's The House Hacking Strategy by Craig Kurilop, I think is how you say his name. That's a great book. Okay, wholesaling is the second strategy. So this is truly, if, if I could go back in time and I was going to restart everything and I didn't have any money, I would do wholesaling. Wholesaling is where you go out and you find a great deal on an investment property. You make an offer, you get something called an assignable contract, and then you can take that contract and sell it to another investor, which is brilliant because finding the deal is the hardest part. part. So trust me when I say that investors will pay you if you bring them good deals. Other real estate investors, you can find them in the local association or just by networking in your area, but that's how wholesaling works. And it's it's awesome. I've seen wholesalers make 5, 10, 20 grand per deal just by finding the property and selling that to somebody else. And what's even better about that is that you're learning as you go. So it would only take you, you know, three or four, it would only take you a handful of these to have enough money to then purchase your own investment property. And just think about by then, you'll have so much more knowledge about what to look for, how to make a good offer, how to negotiate, and you will be set to start real estate investing on your own. So that's how anyone can do it with literally zero dollars. That's wholesaling. Those are the two strategies. I'm going to talk about one last 
one that I think is really cool. And then we will open up for Q&A. So again, be thinking of your questions. Okay, so if you're, I think this was a question that somebody asked me, which was where can a college student start for creating passive income? Like which passive income stream specifically? So I've already said, if you don't have a lot of money, royalty income is a great place to focus because it normally requires more time than money. And there's a specific one that I think is a lot of fun. It's, this is one of my passive income streams and I forgot to mention it earlier, but it is called print on demand. Okay, print on demand, P-O-D. So a lot of people just call it pod, but print on demand, think about if you're selling physical products at a store. Normally you would have to have a storefront, you'd have to have all this inventory to get set up and sell products. The problem with that is that you're taking such a financial risk. What if those items don't sell? What if no one likes them, no one wants to buy them? Then you're stuck with all that inventory, okay? That's a huge financial risk. Now with print on demand, there are all of these platforms like Amazon Merch and Teespring and Redbubble, and they have all these different products, sweatpants, um, tote bags, phone cases, hoodies. And basically you can upload designs onto those products and then you get paid a royalty only if they sell. Okay, so I, if this isn't blowing your mind, I just have to repeat this. Okay, you can upload designs on those physical products that are sold through these platforms, and you only get paid a royalty if it sells. So what is so brilliant about that is that you don't have to carry an inventory because everything's made to order these products are only printed and made once they've actually been ordered. So you're not taking an inventory risk or a financial risk. You can upload designs all day long, just get paid on the ones that sell and call it a day. So I have that passive income stream as well, basically earning royalties through print on demand. And I'm not actively looking to grow it. I'm not working on it. It's actually truly passive for me right now. It's only making something like 200 bucks a month, but still that's 200 bucks a month. And in my biggest month, when my husband and I were really putting a lot of work into this, we made $1,700 a month. So I know there's a lot of potential there. We talk all the time about how we're missing out on this. We just don't have time to invest. But I think that's a, um, an income stream anyone can do, even if you don't have design experience, okay? I don't know how to use Photoshop. I can do text-based designs on my own, but for everything else, I'm outsourcing the designs. So I find people on websites like Fiverr and Upwork, and I'll pay them a few bucks per design, and they'll just send me 20 designs a day, and I'll get them uploaded, and I get paid off the ones that sell. So don't count yourself out. This is truly something that I don't think requires money or skill. It just requires time. That's print on demand. Okay, so I've done a lot of talking, so I think it's your all's turn now. Um, I've gone through everything I wanted to go through. So what I would love to do, it looks like we have about 20 minutes left. I would love to start taking questions. Um, so I'm going to open up the chat and see if there's anything there. And then um, Leanne, if there's any questions like you've received too, let me know. Sure. Um, okay, so Amy said, what was the company you said you sold for to become student debt free? Cutco, Cutco Cutlery. It's a direct sales company. It's not an MLM. A lot of people get those mixed up, but I'm a huge advocate of them. I think it's a great company to work for. So that's Cutco, C-U-T-C-O, Cutlery. Um, okay, what else? Any other questions or comments or anything that you guys want me to talk about? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, or I think I can go back and see that there were some other pre-submitted questions. So I can just address those for now. Does that work for everybody? Yeah, I can read some. Oh, you got a question. Um, would you recommend investing in real estate in a state that you do not live in? That's a great question. Yes. It, like if you're in California, yes. <laughs> if you're in New York City, yes. I think this is something everyone can consider. Um, and now that I'm a long distance landlord, I know that it's doable. I, I know of people who have invested in other states without even having personally seen the property and they're making a ton of money. So here's the scenario where I would consider it is if you truly can't find a deal in your city because it's so overpriced, that's when you want to start thinking about looking in other states. And I do think that the Midwest is a great place to invest. Places like Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, that's where all of mine are. 
Um, even Tennessee, there can be some great areas there. So I would definitely look into it. I have actually, I was worried it was going to be hard to manage our properties when we moved to Colorado, but my husband and I have found it to be even easier because we used to go down to the properties two or three times a week. We would always be there. But now that we're in Colorado, we're forced to outsource, which is great because we have been forced to manage things more efficiently, have people in place that can help us. So I, I actually prefer it this way. I think it's a lot easier. Um, so yes, I would in recommend investing out of state if you need to. Okay, I got another question. Do you have any times to simul become student debt free while growing passive income, I would just go back to that print on demand. If you're a student now and you want to like work on becoming debt free as a student while growing passive income streams, I think print on demand is the way to go for sure. What did you do for Cutco to earn that much money? Okay, so Cutco is a direct sales company. They sell high quality knives. Okay, I know it sounds sketchy. My parents were less than thrilled about the idea of me selling sharp objects to their family and friends, but that's what I did. Um, it's based off of referrals, so I'm not going into like complete strangers' homes. But um, I worked really hard like over the summer, and I just I broke sales records in Kentucky and sold a ton of knives, and I made about ten thousand dollars per summer selling Cutco. So that's how that works. Okay, Brittany says I was wondering about the wholesale method. Um, it sounds super interesting. I was wondering if people making these deals have caught on and have measures to prevent this. So there's nothing wrong with wholesaling. It's just a way of a wholesaler making money. The beautiful thing about it is that finding the deal is the hardest part. So other investors that have a ton of money, they don't necessarily have the capacity to like go search around in the city to find good deals and to get an offer on those deals. So wholesaling, it just makes it easier for them. You're kind of acting like almost like a middleman for matching up a buyer and a seller that otherwise would not have found each other and you're getting paid a fee to do it. So there's nothing like ethically or morally wrong with it. I think what you're asking is, are people catching on and doing this where it's becoming really competitive? So I will say that real estate investing in general is, is competitive. It's hard to find a good deal. A lot of people try to find deals on the MLS and sometimes you can have luck. I've had luck with that. But a lot of times that's even too saturated to find a good deal. So then you have to start looking into other super creative ways. And I talk about this a little bit in my book about passive income, but things like um, getting lists of short sales and pre foreclosures and reaching out to them because they're in a situation where they're underwater sometimes and they're not in a good financial situation. And it can be a win-win if you can help them out of that situation. Now, I would trust everyone would act like with uh, morally and ethically here because there's a lot of slimy investors that take advantage of people. And obviously, no one on this call would would be like that at all. That's just something to watch out for is just treating people the right way. Um, there's also you can get like probate lists. And as long as you're approaching them in a respectful, kind way, that can help people out of bad situations as well. You can do bandit signs, which is where you're literally putting signs up in neighborhoods saying, hey, we buy houses with a phone number for people to call. You can literally drive around and look for properties that appear to be vacant, look up the tax records to find the owner, and then sell, send them letters to try to get in contact with them and see if they want to sell the property to you. So I could go on and on about creative, unique ways to find deals, but that's kind of how wholesaling works. And if you want to be a good wholesaler, those are the things you're going to have to be willing to do because that's how you're going to find the best deals. So let me know if that answers your, your question. Um, okay, what percent of any, if any, of your monthly and yearly income do you reinvest and in what? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I would say that we are saving $10,000 a month on average still. So we have so much passive income and our expenses are so low at this point that we're still able to save an enormous amount of money. What am I investing in? So that's what I'm trying to figure out because <laughs> I have, there's a lot that's sitting in like a high yield savings account. The problem with that is that the interest rates have dropped so low. I'd be more okay with that if it was still earning 2%, but now that account is earning 0.5%. So I'm starting to try to get some of that money reinvested back in the stock market. So whether that means upping our um, retirement contributions and making sure we're maxing out the IRAs 
or just investing in a normal taxable investment account. We're just trying to suck more money into the stock market. And then the other thing we're doing is we're investing in real estate syndications. I mentioned that earlier. That is one of our passive income streams now. Um, but basically, that is where a group of investors wants to buy a deal and they have a really good property, but they need to raise money to buy it because they can't buy it alone. So they go to other investors and they say, hey, can you be a part of this deal? Can you provide some equity and we'll pay you a portion of the profits in return? So it's kind of like you're a silent partner and it's awesome because it's true mailbox money. I mean, we invest in these and then we're going to be earning a, a check each quarter. We don't have to do a thing. So that's where we're starting to put more of our money is into real estate syndications. Um, okay. For Redbubble print on demand, what items have brought in the most profit in your experience? T-shirts. Definitely T-shirts. I would have thought that it would have been totally saturated by now. But those T-shirts still sell like crazy. Um, I, I think that some people just do a text-based design on a t-shirt. Some people just do like a graphic image on a t-shirt. We do a little bit of both, and I can't say that one outsells the other, but definitely like t-shirts more than anything. So that's where I would focus. Um, do you have any sort of contact info to keep in touch with us if you continue to have questions with us? So you can follow me on Instagram at moneyhoneyrachel. I do my best, guys, to answer all questions. Sometimes I can't get to all of them, but I definitely would love to, to be of value to you even after this. So definitely connect with me on Instagram. I'm on Facebook and I'm on TikTok as well. Um, so that's interesting on TikTok. Not necessarily about finance, but you can follow me there too, Money Honey Rachel. So that's how you can get in touch with me. And then Christina had a question, are vacation properties better or worse than investing in a local city properties? Okay, that's a great question. So when you think about investing in real estate, there's kind of two broad categories. Well, there's lots of categories, but you can look at it in terms of short-term rentals and long-term rentals. So a traditional real estate investor would probably buy, you know, single family houses or duplexes, rent them out to tenants on 12-month leases. That's a pretty traditional way of investing in real estate. On the other hand, if you focus on the short-term rentals, then you're, you're talking about being like an Airbnb host or putting your vacation house for rent on VRBO, something like that. I think both of those are great ways to generate income. The trade-off is that it's a time versus money trade-off. With a traditional property where you have long-term tenants, it's a lot less work. So it is going to be more passive. Then with Airbnbs and VRBO and short-term rentals, it's going to be more work, but you're also going to make more money. So it just depends on your goals and what you want to do. Because you have to manage those tenants. You have to be available for them. You have to coordinate cleanings and tenant turnovers a lot more often. So that's why it's more work to do that. But it also is more lucrative. So I think both are great options, just depending on what, what goals you have. Um, okay, keep the questions coming, guys. Anything else? Those were a lot of really great questions. I was talking really fast, so I apologize. I just want to make sure I answer all of your questions. We have about 10 more minutes. Yes, no problem, Christina. Thank you. Um, what other questions do you guys have? You can ask me anything about real estate investing, money management, entrepreneurship, um, my income. I'm very transparent and open about everything. Rachel, yes. if you had, um, I know this was a question that um, was previously submitted, and I'm going to alter it a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you had $500 to invest in any passive income stream today, um, what stream would you choose for that? Oh, that's a good question. There's so many. Um, my, so my mind is going back and forth between wholesaling, which you really wouldn't need $500. You wouldn't need any money for that. So that one or print on demand. Because if you, and you really don't need any money for print on demand either if you figure out how to use Photoshop, but I would, in, I would probably invest that $500 into getting like hundreds of designs made from different designers so that I can like upload a ton of designs and that can take off. So that's what I would say. That's a great question. I'm going to look too at some of the other um, questions. Oh, here's a good one. What is the best advice you would give to your 22 year old self? This was a question that was submitted beforehand. So. Oh, I love this question. What advice would I give to my 22-year-old self? 
there's advice given to young entrepreneurs that I agree with to an extent. And that advice is say yes to every opportunity that comes your way. Okay. I agree with that. When you are starting your business, when you're hustling, you need to get your name out there. I agree. Say yes to every opportunity that comes your way. The problem is that there comes a point that if you continue to follow that advice, that's going to be really bad for you. That's going to lead to burnout and anxiety and stress. And that's exactly what happened to me. Because the last thing you want, and what I realized once I started really getting into real estate investing in my book business, and I started getting a lot of inquiries, my schedule was filling up with everyone else's priorities but my own. And I started to feel very helpless, like I didn't have any control over my schedule. This was a scary lesson for me because it did develop and result in anxiety and a lot of difficulties. I've learned, I'm grateful for it though, because I've learned that saying no is actually a much more powerful thing, right? Even in terms of real estate investing, guys, saying no to those opportunities that just aren't quite perfect, never settling, you know, really being patient. Saying no can be powerful. So I think just having that mindset of I don't have to, you know, no one deserves my time or my advice for free. I don't have to say yes to everyone and everything. You really need to be protective and, and focused on your schedule and know what's important and what's not. So that is my advice for my 22-year-old self. Thank you for asking. I like that question. Um, how do you find good places to put coin-operated machines and how do you keep up with stocking them? Okay, coin-operated machines, it's not something I've personally done, but I've researched it and I've learned a lot about it. So the best way that I know of to find good locations is to like get out there and sort of canvas and network. Literally going into office buildings, I would even picture myself going in with the spreadsheet with the name of the building, whether they already have a vending machine or not, what kind of business that they're doing, so you can really start doing some research. So again, you guys, this is gonna take a lot of time up front to invest in order to create this passive income stream. But I would get out there and then kind of narrow it down, see which opportunities you think are the best and start reaching out to the owners of those buildings. I would do that by going there and asking the, like the tenants or whoever's on the lease of those buildings, if they know the owner and can put you in touch. Or again, normally you can search like tax records in your city and you can potentially find the owner that way. And then it just becomes about like making an offer. A lot of, um, there's typically like a, a commission split or a profit split. So you would offer the the business owner, hey, I'll, I'll share X percent of my profits with you if you'll let me put my vending machine in your lobby. And they're not going to say no to free money. So it's a win-win for both people. That's what I would say. How do you keep up with stocking them? Most people that I follow online that do vending machines, they go to Costco and Sam's like once a month and stock up on all that stuff, candy and soda and everything. And then either they will go once a week to restock or they'll hire somebody to do that part for them to make it even more passive. So that is my answer to that. Thank you for asking. Um, Leanne, I, I'm going to, I'm going to answer a few more of the pre-submitted questions, but cut me off if we're running out of time. Okay. How, let's see this one. Oh, this is a good question. Is it worth working really hard in college, but sacrificing your social life in order to pay off student debt? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I feel like people sometimes will look at my story or, or see that I'm a 27 year old retiree. And it's like, man, that's amazing. You know, like financial freedom. That's so sexy. That's so glamorous. Right. But what people don't see is the sacrifices that I made literally since I was 18 years old until last year when I was able to quit my job, years of working 80 hours, weeks, years of saying no to social engagements so that I could sell, do cut co appointments or make other decisions. Um, it was definitely an enormous sacrifice. And for me to answer the question, is it worth it? That's a personal question. You, you'll know if it's worth it to you. And I think the best way to start out is just experiment with making some of those decisions because you don't have to give up your social if you don't want to. I know that's an enormous trade-off, but I do think that's a personal question. I, it's hard for me to say whether I look back and regret anything because now that I'm in the position I'm in, <laughs> I'm very happy and fortunate, but I do think I could have done things differently to balance 
things out better so that I wasn't so anxious and stressed? I would say that was the hardest part for me. So I love that question. Thank you. Um, I'm monitoring the chat if you guys have any more questions on the live. Otherwise, I'll keep answering a couple more pre-submitted questions. Um, let's see. Okay, where should I start to make the most of my money? How do I save more money? I love that. Okay, if you're just starting out and don't know a ton about money management or where to begin, but you want to get started, here's what I would say. Track your expenses. That's the very first step. This is the most eye-opening thing you will ever do when it comes to your finances. For example, and I feel like I shouldn't admit this because I'm supposed to be a finance guru, but the first month my husband and I did this, we realized we were spending over $900 on groceries. For two people, guys, $900. That's not even including restaurants. $900 on groceries, okay? That is more than some people are paying for their mortgage payment or their rent payment. So it was very embarrassing. But also, once you do that, it will be very obvious where to cut back, and you will naturally want to put a budget into place from there. There's this quote by Dave Ramsey that I love to share. He said, a budget is simply telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. Isn't that great? A budget is simply telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. That's all you want to do is start out by tracking your expenses. You can use Mint. It's a free platform. And the way it works is you link all of your credit cards, debit cards, banks, bank accounts. That way it makes it very easy to see where your money is going. So again, that's Mint. It's a free app. It's a free website. That's a great place to get started. Then after about 30 days of tracking your expenses, you'll start to see, okay, here's, here are my opportunities. Here's where I can cut back and you can start to put a budget into place from there. So that's where I would say to start. That's a great question. Um, any other questions or Leanne, do you have anything, anything else that you guys want me to cover? This, I feel like I've given a, a ton of info. I hope I've answer, answered all of your questions so far. I've been trying to like talk fast to get it all out. <laughs> no, this was awesome. We're just at about time anyway. So that was perfect. Yay! Um, so thank you so much and thank you to all of our attendees and for such amazing questions. Um, as a reminder, our 1856 Society members who have tuned in tonight will be receiving a free copy of Rachel's book, Money Honey, which Yay. will be mailed out next week. Um, it's not too late to join the 1856 Society by donating $18.56 or more to an area on campus that you're passionate about. You can visit www.shu.edu slash 1856society to join and stay up to date with exclusive opportunities that we'll be offering um, members in the future. So follow at SHU1856society on Instagram and at Money Honey Rachel to follow Rachel. Um, so best of luck for the future semester to all of our students. And Rachel, thank you again so, so much for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you guys for having me. I loved all the questions you asked. This was a ton of fun. Um, Leanne, send me that link. I would love to make an $18.56 donation. And I encourage everyone on the call to do the same thing. And thank you again so much for having me. Thank you, Rachel. Bye.